JLF's Brave New World, welcomes you back to our second episode for the day. For those of you who missed our previous episode on life and writing, with two-time Booker Award winner Peter Carey in conversation with Chandra Haas Chaudhary, you can watch it and our earlier episodes on our Facebook page, JLF Lit Fest, or on our YouTube channel, Jaipur Lit Fest JLF. Today, we're delighted to introduce the art of stillness. At a moment of overwhelming change, the master essayist and novelist Pequair takes us into the heart of stillness and changelessness. In conversation with publisher Meru Gokhale, he shares the secret of solitude and the learnings of silence so essential to survive our present times. Pequair is author of more than a dozen books translated into 23 languages, Lady and the Monk, Four Seasons in Kyoto, Sun After Dark, A Flights into the Foreign, uh, the Open Road, The Global Journey of the 14th Dalai Lama, The Man Within My Head, The Art of Stillness, Adventures in Going Nowhere, and his latest work is a new book on Japan titled Autumn Light, followed by a Beginner's Guide to Japan, and this could be home published in 2019. Meru Gokhale is Editor-in-Chief of Literary Publishing at Penguin Random House India. She publishes authors including Arundhati Roy, Amitabh Ghosh, Jhumpa Lahiri, Salman Rashti, Ramchandra Guha, Paolo Kohelo, and Moshid Hamid, among others. Please do ask questions by typing it in into our comments sections and do follow our handles, JLF Litfest, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get notified on the upcoming sessions. In case any of you get dropped off due to the bandwidth issue, you can find us on our YouTube channel, Jaipur Litfest JLF. Uh, Piku, uh, Meru, over to both of you. Thank you for being on board. Thank you, Sanjoy. I'm just so looking forward to this discussion. Uh, Pico, it's really lovely to see you again. How are you? Uh, where are you? Because <laughs> that could be anywhere. <laughs> I'm embarrassingly well, at least for now. Um, I'm in our little tiny two-room rented apartment in Japan. Uh, the cherry blossoms are flowering over every last stream and path. Uh, the nightingales are teaching the young to sing. The old folks are taking themselves and their dogs for a neighborhood around the neighborhood and things really look very much the way they always do. So we're in a bit of a cocoon here. You're in Delhi, I'm guessing, yes, are you? I'm in Delhi right now. Um, so, you know, since we have half an hour, I'm just going to get started because I want to start with the subject of our talk, which is the art of stillness. Now, you gave a hugely popular TED talk, the art of stillness, adventures and going nowhere. Now, can you tell us a little bit about it and the message that you were trying to convey? So when you talk about going nowhere, what do you mean? You mean this, of course, in a positive sense, where a lot of people might look at the word, the phrase going nowhere, see it as something negative, but you see it as something positive. Tell us a little bit about that, because all of us are going nowhere at the moment, because as you know, in India, we're currently in lockdown. Yes, all of us are going nowhere. But as you say, that doesn't have to be a bad thing. I always remember that line from Shakespeare, there's nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. I think all of us are thinking most right now about the people without a roof over their heads, without resources, without a job to go back to, and they're the ones we need to be concerned about. But I'm guessing many of the people who are listening to this conversation are among the relatively fortunate. And actually, this is a rare opportunity um, to think about what really sustains us. You know, so many of my friends in the last few years have said, my life's got out of control. I don't know what to do. I'm moving at this post-human speed. I've got more data coming in on me than I know what to do with. I never get to spend time with my friends and family or reading a book. Now is that chance. And now is the chance really to reboot and consider whether you want to be racing around or whether actually you don't live a richer life um, being quiet. And I think this idea came to me from what you know better than I, because you're a publisher and you deal with so many writers. You know that most of your writers go out into the world, um, travel or have experiences, and then come back, and they can only turn their experience into meaning by sitting absolutely still. And probably most of your writers spend 90% of their lives at their desk alone, traveling into the darkness of their own being and their memories and their imaginations, um, not living the glamorous globetrotting lives that many readers imagine. And so for me, 
yeah, travel is how I see the sights of the world, but stillness is how I try to turn those into insights. And travel to me is like going out into a market and gathering lots of ingredients, but stillness is where I turn them into a meal. So I find it's very hard to be moved when I'm running around. I can only really be moved and therefore transformed when I'm in one place. And so as a writer, my job is to sit still most of the time. And I find that such a great adventure that in my book and then the talk that came out of that book, I thought, well, maybe many of us would gain something from um, not trying to keep up with these accelerated machines we can never keep up with. You know, it's funny you should mention that. And I'll come back in a minute to what you've been talking about right now, which is that that very, very um, interesting connection between experiences which are out there in the world and the stillness in which people actually, uh, you know, you li live that same experience again and again through being still. I'll come back to that in a minute, but I want to talk to you about something you mentioned about writers, which is very true. And that is that uh, writers know solitude better than anybody else. And they're used to it. This is what they do. And I, as a writer, what can you share with our viewers about how to deal with sol how to deal with solitude how to make it your friend and how to inhabit it comfortably you answered it beautifully because i was just going to say make it your friend um like any partner like your wife or husband or best friend half the time it's aggravating infuriating you want to be somewhere else but deep down it is your your best friend um and every writer knows and you must hear it every day in your life that 50% of the time in, the, in one's desk is absolute misery. It's lonely, it's boring, it's painful. The muse isn't making a house call. One's just sitting there while one's friends seem to be out in the world having fun. But if you sit there long enough, the muse suddenly does arrive and then the heavens open and things come out of you that you didn't know you had inside you. You become, I think, a better, wiser, deeper version of yourself. And you probably remember I, I started my little book on stillness by describing a trip I made up into a monastery behind um, Los Angeles where I saw this ragged man in a tattered uh, black gown and wire rim glasses who uh, took me into my little cabin and started cooking for me. And he turned around at some point, he said, I'm 61 years old and this is the voluptuous and delicious adventure I've found in life. That man, to my surprise, turned out to be Leonard Cohen, the great poet and singer songwriter. He'd already been famous for 30 years. He'd tasted everything that the world has to offer in terms of sex and drugs and rock and roll. And he had found his greatest fulfillment and joy sitting still and in his case he was scrubbing floors and shoveling snow and uh, really cooking just for his fellow monks and i thought if this wise man in his 60s thinks that stillness is a better adventure and a better drug than anything else i need to give myself to it even more than before and now i'm older than he was then and i would i would say the same thing i've been lucky to travel a lot and re lead what i think is a rich life but my greatest highlights have probably come at my desk and I'm sure all your writers say some version of that to you. But it's lovely what you just said, uh, stillness as an adventure and stillness as a drug and stillness is something it's so odd because it's what people seek but it's also what they run away from and it's that constant tug between what you seek and what you instinctively run away from and that zone of discomfort in between that which is really interesting to me because as a society, one thing the coronavirus epidemic has or pandemic has exposed is how uncomfortable we are as a society with being uncomfortable. That you know, we expect to not be uncomfortable with our thoughts, with our situations. Of course, that's as you said earlier, it's at the glossier end of you know fortune. Mm. But but it, it, it's now uh, you know what people expect and one thing that this uh, situation has brought to the front of everyone's existence is you have to learn to get comfortable with that part of yourself which is which is not still you have to confront it and look at it and as a writer there are, i know there will be a lot of people out there who will be thinking that this is a really time for me to write my book and, but you know, you're an experienced writer, but a lot of people might not know how to tame that feeling of sort of composing yourself to be able to sit down at your desk everywhere. What is the most practical bit of advice you can give to them? Well, that's a perfect question because I was once visiting a family member in India 
And she was in business, but her great dream was to be a writer. And just as I was leaving the house, she said, what advice would you give to me? And I said, just spend two hours a day at your desk. And some days nothing will come to you. Other days more will come to you than you know what to do with. But you probably spend two hours doing yoga every day or going shopping or going to the health club. Why don't you set aside two hours for writing? And she was a very disciplined person. She said, okay. One year later, she got in touch with me. And she said, I finished my book. And that book was actually published by your company, Penguin India. My, my, my friend who had no experience in publication at all wrote a book just through two hours a day. And she just kept that sentence above her desk. And she said that very practical down to earth thing really gave her information. And I loved what you said about the comfort and discomfort because in some ways it's like you know, going to the dentist. None of us likes going to the dentist and having him drill at our teeth, but we know the end result is that we're happier and clearer. And as I say, stillness isn't all sweetness and light. A lot of it is aggravation. And I stress in my book that nobody wants enforced stillness, which is really what we're going through now. Nobody wants to be a prisoner or an invalid or to be stuck um, beyond her control. But um, if, we, if we work with stillness uh, in the right way, I think um, it opens doors that we've forgotten about. And I guess what I really mean is, I'm much, bef I'm happiest of all when I'm completely absorbed in something. When I'm writing a book or reading a book or watching a movie or talking to my wife, I forget the time, I forget myself. That's when I'm happiest. And I'm least happy when I'm running around multitasking, doing 10 things at once and nowhere at all. And yet I spend too much of my time multitasking and running away from where my happiness is and then wondering why I'm so jangled and confused. And I think all of us, probably most of us at that same state, we much prefer a three-hour conversation than 63-minute conversations. It enriches us. And so I think that's what stillness is about, the chance for really deep absorption, losing yourself in a book you're reading or a book you're writing, or it might well be the wife you're talking to or husband you're talking to that you haven't kept up with for a long time. That that's what really gives us the richness to go back into the world and have something concrete to offer. Because if we're running around, when a friend calls us and a friend in need calls us, all we can say is, you know, catch you later, I'm sorry I don't have time, or here's my two-word answer. And we don't have anything to give to the world or to ourselves. Um, you know, I've been thinking about this a lot because my 88-year-old mother back in California has been in hospital. And I was all set to fly over and see her when I found out that in California, one's not allowed to visit. So actually, I'm as close to her here in Japan as, um, as I would be if I were 10 minutes away in her hometown. And I was thinking, what can I give my mother that will sustain her as an older lady who's been rather frail and can support me? And I thought the only thing I have really to offer her is my inner resources, what I've gathered within my financial resources, not particularly going to help her right now. The places I've been are not going to help her. The books I've read even are not going to help her. The only thing I can bring to her in her time of need is such clarity or calm as I've gathered. And I can only gather that, I think, by sitting still. And you must be the same as a, as a publisher and editor. I'm guessing that when you're working on a text, you have to take a deep breath and really bring your full concentration to it rather than just doing it in three minute segments, as it were. Absolutely. I'm not a fan of multitasking at all. And I think that <laughs> multitasking is, um, I, I don't, I'm not sure who invented it as this kind of, uh, you know, I, I mean, people have, of course, written about this, uh, you know, this, this productivity trap and this idea that productivity is something to be applauded in and of itself, that, you know, just the act of being busy makes you somehow a better person. And uh, just coming back to what you said about absorption and being completely absorbed, it's, it's a beautiful thing which you say, because that to me is the simple most practical piece of advice that i can think of because what what is the what is it what does it mean to be absorbed by what you're doing it's it's the same thing as when you see a very small child playing with something and you know that the child is so absorbed in it that that he or she has forgotten that they're even playing yes, and yes. and if you we can bring that sense of play into or even that sense of like not worrying so much about it because i think a lot of people once they sit down and say, well, I'm only going to do this one thing, the way the mind works is you're going to think about everything, right? Apart from, from that one thing that you're, that you supposedly have to be doing. So that, that's, a, that's lovely. It just sets other things aside, spend some time just giving yourself to whatever it is that you're doing at that moment. And that gives its own joy, I think. 
Yes. Take a walk without your headphones. Um, when you're on the treadmill at the health club, don't have the TV on. Um, turn off the lights when you're waiting for your wife to come home at the end of the day and suddenly you've got a little holiday. And what you said about busyness is so true because I think in every culture people have known that those who are very busy are seldom too wise. <laughs> and those who are wise are seldom too busy. And I think also those who are busy, I think are seldom kind and seldom very happy. And when you were talking about the concrete aspects to sort of build our savings account within, um, as Sanjay was saying, one of the books that your publisher, publishing company brings out of mine is um, a biography of the Dalai Lama. Yes. And I travel with him across Japan every year. And the thing that really strikes me is there is a man who's 84 years old. He's doing eight hours every day and all the world coming to him with requests and lifelong, you know, wrenching problems and questions. He never takes a single break. And when I'm with him, I notice that he brings to every last stranger or every child his full attention. And sometimes I'm exhausted just watching him go through his day, though I'm not doing anything and I'm 22 years younger than he. And then I remember every day when he wakes up, he spends his four, first four hours meditating. And that's how he gathers himself for these furiously congested days. So at some level, he's got a very busy life, but he prepares for that busyness by sitting still for four hours. So none of us is the Dalai Lama, none of us is as busy as he. But I think, well, if the Dalai Lama can afford to spend four hours every day gathering himself for the day to come, maybe I could spend 20 minutes at least. Uh, and I'm sure the rest of my day and everyone around me would be much happier if I spent 20 minutes just quietly without any devices in one corner of my room before I enter the day. It's interesting because uh, tell us a little bit about uh, meditation as a route to your creativity and to route to your, you know, sort of replenishing your inner resources. But before, before we go on to that, I just want to say it made me so happy to hear you say what you said about busyness, because while it occurred to me that busyness is now a consumer product, it's been repackaged as a virtue, yes. which we all have to buy. And, and, and it's, it's, there are products around it and we're all made to feel that it's a virtue in and of itself. And this is a really good time for us to lose that habit, you know, if we can. Yes, people boast about being busy, but I don't yeah. want my friend's <laughs> wife to be busy. When I come to them with a serious, intimate conversation, I don't want them to be scattered and dispersed, and nor do they want that of me. Now, your meditation question is perfect because <laughs> I have never meditated a minute in my life. I, I, and, I love and, uh, yeah, I must uh, tell you that I, in that case, I applaud you for the way you prescribed it so nicely right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have the big advantage that you know uh, well <laughs> about, which is being a being, You spend time traveling with the Dalai Lama, so you get to prescribe it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I, I, I practice meditation by proxy by watching the Dalai Lama practice. Um, <laughs> but, but I was going to say, you know, my wife is sitting across across the room now and yeah. there, supposed to do on yes Zoom. she's eager to, to to see you and your family soon um but whenever i say what i just said which is i've never practiced meditation at all she falls around laughing and says wait a minute every day when you wake up after breakfast you go and sit at a desk for five hours and never move and I, that's my way of saying yeah, writing is, is a form of meditation and it's about seeing past your thoughts, seeing past your projections and illusions, trying to find the true voice beyond and behind all the voices in which you speak. And so I think the beauty and grace of a writer's life um, is that you paid or at least you're encouraged to spend a lot of time sitting still and um, and maybe getting some of the fruits. It's like a beginner's uh, step training wheels for, towards meditation. And I think one gets some of the, the fruits. Uh, I wish I had the discipline to be a meditator because I know how clear and pointed their lives are. But at least to begin with, um, I'm doing my writing practice. Um, and reading, I think, does the same. And that's why I tell a lot of my friends who dream of being writers, it doesn't really matter what happens to the writing, whether five people read it or 5,000 people read it, if I dare say that to a publisher, but you will be the better for just spending that time quietly at, the, at your desk, sifting through your experiences, processing them and trying to understand the world. And I find the more difficult life is, the more grateful I am for writing because my writing every morning is like 
stepping out of the world and walking to a cabin in the woods where I can just be quiet, there are no distractions, good things come to me, bad things have come to me, but I have the luxury of just being able to think through everything that's been going on in my life. And I think that's what most of us are crying out for. As you were saying earlier, this balance between experience and reflection has somehow been thrown out of kilter. And in this unfortunate moment, we've be, been given a chance to reorient or reboot a little bit. No, I think that's uh, because I'm on my next question is to go is going away from sort of stillness to travel. But 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 I want to just pause for a second, because I think that what you've said right now is really important, because in a way, what you're saying is as a society, we spend so much time experience uh, uh, money, effort in accumulating different experiences because I don't know, uh, every 30 year old I know has a bucket list of things they want to do and I always get a little annoyed when I hear this phrase because it's it's more like, you know, checking the box of having that experience is becomes more important than what you do with it. Yes. And, and, and you can have all of the experiences in the world, but if you don't have some method to internalize and let that change you in its own way, then all you're doing is, you know, it's just ticking a box, really. And 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 so now coming back to something which is which what nobody is doing right now, which is travel. Now, Pico, you're known for your love of travel, and we've all sort of traveled the world through your writing. What is the future of travel according to you? Well, I see this just as a hiatus, and uh, if it makes people travel more purposefully and less. In a, as a sort of consumer exercise in the future, that's no bad thing, mostly because of climate change. And I see the virus as um, a temporary cloud covering the world, but I see climate change as the urgent thing confronting us all, all in the next 10 years, 50 years, and 100 years. And climate change has reminded people that um, tra 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 travel is... Um, a very costly exercise in terms of the rest of uh, the planet. So that's another reason I'm a world has come to us, whether you're in LA or Sydney or Vancouver, you don't have to travel far to see Iran and Vietnam and China and Mexico, they're, they're all, all around you. Um, so I think the actual getting on plane and, and moving across the world it's much less important than it used to be. And one of my favorite quotes has always been from Henry David Thoreau, who said, it matters not how far you are, it matters is how you are. And, you know, I have to mention that, as Sanjay said, the last book of mine that, that you published was Autumn Light, Light, which is about 32 years of my traveling in my neighborhood yes. here in Japan. And where you find me now, I have no car, no bicycle. Really, my whole life, for most of the year, takes place only as far as... Um, my little feet will carry me. And I take the same walk every day and it never gets boring. And I think what a traveler understands is, as you were saying, the destination is much less important than what you bring to it. If you have an interested eye, nowhere is boring. And every time I go to the supermarket here in Japan, a surprise awaits me. I don't need to go to Tibet or North Korea um, to have my life overturned. I'm glad I got the chance to do so. But walk down the street in Bombay or Delhi and that's as rich an experience as many people have in their lifetime. So travel ha doesn't have really to do with distance or, as you say, with the bucket list, um, but just with the eyes and attention you bring to whatever's around you. And I think, you know, the, the book Autumn Light that you published was about living with mortality and uncertainty, which is what we're all doing. And it's about beginnings and endings. Exactly, exactly. And I think the message of it is twofold. One, don't take anything for granted. The fact that we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow is exactly why we have to find beauty and joy and wonder right now, which we can. I'm looking out at my window in this radiant, brilliant spring afternoon. What would be nicer than that? And I don't want to take that for granted. And I think the other thing that, that I was trying to unfold in that book was this notion they have in Japan of joyful participation in a world of sorrows. So they believe in Japan that life is hard, as we've been saying, every birth ends in a death, every meeting ends in a separation, but that's not a reason for grief. It's actually a reason for waking up to the joy that's around us this instant. 
Um, and so a book about impermanence doesn't have to be a book about sadness. And I think what the Dalai Lama would say is suffering and unhappiness are not the same thing. Everybody suffers. Most of us will go through sickness at some point. All of us will go through death. Many of us will go through old age. But unhappiness is just the position we choose or cannot choose to, to bring to it. So, you know, travel's a nice thing if you can do it, but it's not a necessity. Whereas I'd say sitting still and making sense of life is a necessity. It's hard to live without that. Absolutely. And I love what you just said right now about taking the same walk every day and seeing something different in it. And that's, I'd, I'd love you to talk a bit more about that because um, while under lockdown, a lot of people are taking the same walk every day, whether it's in a closed room or if they're lucky enough to be able to go outside, then perhaps they can walk up and down the same street. Um, What's your secret um, to looking at the same thing with a fresh pair of eyes every single day? Partly because it's never the same, and I'm never the same. Uh, tomorrow, yesterday it was raining. Today it's bright sunshine. Yesterday there was a person walking past the cherry blossoms with a Sheba dog. Today there was no dog at all. Tomorrow the cherry blossoms will have gone, which is why I'm so glad I could enjoy them last week. And also, and just three days ago, my wife and I took a walk five minutes away from this apartment where we've been living for 27 and a half years. Suddenly we came onto this great bamboo valley um, with avenues of cherry blossoms all around and birdsong. We'd never been to that place. It's five minutes from our flat. But for one thing, we don't often take walks together. And for another, we don't have this spirit of adventure. Usually if we're taking a walk, we're going somewhere to do something. But in this lockdown period, we're thinking we're taking a walk for its own sake. So let's actually go one street away from where we usually walk. And suddenly there were wonders we never guessed at. Um, so again, it, it's not travel has never been a matter of going far, but just looking with wide awake eyes, I think. I, I think that would make for, I'd love to read that as a book someday, just a book called How to Travel Very Close, you know, <laughs> it would be lovely. Yes. <laughs> and and because that, I think that's how, that, that's how we're all going to travel in the future. But now I, I know we don't have too much more time. So I want to ask you that uh, while people are at home under lockdown, do you want to recommend some of your favorite travel books that people can read since they can't actually travel at the moment? What, what would you suggest they read? Well, an obvious one is, is Walden by Henry David Thoreau, in which, which really changed my life. When I was young, I read more or less his saying, I don't want to die feeling I've never lived. And just reading that sentence made me leave my glamorous seeming life in in New York, moved to Japan, and it's a move I've never regretted. But of course, he was, again, just really traveling within his little cabin and around the lake, and he found the whole world and much more there. Not far from the town where he had been living, but in quiet, he could read, he could watch the stars, he could hear the water outside, and suddenly all his senses were turned on. I love Emily Dickinson, who spent 26 years in a room, but I would call her one of the great uh, travelers of, of all time. I was recently thinking there's an American called Admiral Byrd who ended up stranded in um, the South Pole alone for five months and he wrote a book called Alone which very much speaks to this moment and nothing had prepared him for suddenly being stuck in this tiny space but once he was in that tiny space he thought most of the things I live with I actually don't need and in this tiny space, in a curious way, I feel liberated, as I never do when I'm lead, leading my regular life. And again, I, I stress that when people are forced to be sitting still as now, we're all going to be um, uncomfortable. We can't pretend it's going to be rosy, and I don't want to be too optimistic. But nor do I want to say this is all darkness and gloom. And we will find things when we're alone, when we're quiet, or when we're surrounded by our loved ones that we would never find in our daily routine. And I always find as a traveler, what I most seek is not being removed from my home, but being removed from my habits because my habits allow me to sleepwalk and kind of keep the blinders on. So this moment has forced all of us out of our habits. And I think it's thus opened our eyes to some of the things we've forgotten and some of the things that we can more usefully take back into our lives um, when they resume. You asked the travel books, two that come to my mind. One is The Snow Leopard by Peter Matheson, where he amazing. travels into, what an amazing um, book. Isn't it great? It's amazing. beautiful. What a book. 
and it, about traveling into a region in Nepal most people have never seen, but traveling into grief and anger and confusion because he's just lost his young wife to cancer. Um, Servants in Tibet is another beautiful book, uh, beginning with him stuck in a POW camp in northern India, breaking free and suddenly ending up in Lhasa and becoming the friend of the Dalai Lama. Um, and what I like about that book is Heinrich Harrer, the, the author, was just a kind of rough and ready mountaineer who happened to be caught up in the war. But as he traveled across Tibet, learned Tibetan and then settled into Lhasa, you can feel him being transformed. And in the last paragraph of that book, he sounds like a radiant lyric poet and a sage, which is certainly not who he had been two years earlier. Um, it's a reminder that tough, tough times can transform us for the better in both those books, I'd say. And it would be such a shame that an experience of this magnitude, if it didn't transform us in some way, if we emerge from this exactly the same as we were, it would be it would be awful, actually, if you think about it, because it means we would have absorbed nothing. We would have learned nothing. And and the biggest takeaway, I think, from what you have said today to me is we don't actually need permission to sit still. And, it, and it, it's it's something that if we do that now, we will all be the richer for it. I, I don't know about you, but I have a lot, I know a lot of people who are using this time to do everything from, you know, baking bread to learning a new language or sort of busying up their schedules, which is nice also, of course, but it would be lovely if people also allowed themselves to come out of that zone of filling up your day with stuff every day and just letting yourself be and see what happens and sort of surrender yourself a little bit into that feeling of the unknown and see where that takes you. I love that, Mary. And exactly what you said at the outset about if we were not transformed, this experience is wasted. It's one of the wisest things I've, I've heard because we're all aware of the frustration, the inconvenience, sometimes the pain and danger. But you're absolutely right that there's a potential for so many other things. So let us not let um, our emotions pull us towards the difficult stuff without acknowledging the chance to live as we never lived and therefore live better when we go back to our regular lives. I think that's an absolutely lovely note to end on. And uh, before I do that, do you have one last message for our audience before we leave today? Well, I recently came across this lovely sentence in, in Kyoto, take care of the mind and you take care of the world. And I think that's what both of us have been talking about. And usually we're rushing around too much to take care of the mind. We're taking care of our kids, of our bosses, of our friends, of our obligations, going to the pharmacy, the shopping mall, whatever. This is a great chance to take care of the mind. And once you've done that, I think the world begins to take care of itself, not entirely, but much more than we might imagine. So I think this moment reminds me that we have less power over the external world than we imagine, but much more power over the internal world than we suspect. And this is the time to make the most of that second part. That's a very beautiful message, Pico. And I don't think that anything I say can improve on that. So I'm going to hand, <laughs> ha hand it all back to Sanjoy before, um, before we wind up. Thank you so much. It's always a massive pleasure talking to you. And uh, Sanjoy, over to you. It's always a massive pleasure to hear both of you because that was amazing. And the fact that you actually don't meditate, but you sort of represent everything that's meditative and the entire stillness of being. So thank you so much for joining us on JLF's Brave New World. Thank you, Meru Gokhale. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we hope you enjoyed that episode and will share it on your social media pages. Please do log on to our social media handle to continue to watch the live, the live sessions. And in case you missed them, you can still catch them on your YouTube channel, JPR Lit Fest, and of course on the Facebook page, JLF Lit Fest, and JLF Lit Fest on Twitter. Thank you all so much, and stay safe and stay well. Please do not forget to tune in on Saturday, the 18th of April, and on Sunday, the 19th of April, for our next series. On Saturday, we have Walls and Bridges, Prayag Akbar in conversation with Nandini Nair, a session on dystopian fiction and its disturbing emergence in reality. Prayag Akbar speaks about his chilling novel, Lila, which was adapted as a Netflix web series with journalist Nandini Nair, the literary and cultural editor of Open Magazine. On the second episode for that day is Library of Exile, Edmund Duval in conversation with Anshal Malhotra. 
Edmund de Waal, acclaimed author of The Hair with the Amber Eyes, is a leading contemporary artist and a master potter. He talks about his current project, The Library of Exile in the British Museum, which houses more than 2,000 books in translation written by exiled authors that he created and launched last year as a space to sit and read and be. And this is at 9 p.m. Indian Standard Time, 4.30 p.m. British Summer Time and 11.30 a.m. Eastern Time on Saturday. On Sunday, 19th April, we have Life Under Lockdown. Uh, Alain de Botton is a Swiss-British writer and philosopher whose essay in love has sold more than 2 million copies. He talks about his life and work and his thoughts on living under lockdown. He's in conversation with Anandita Ghosh, a writer and the editor-in-chief of Mint Lounge. This is at 7.30 p.m. Indian Standard Time, 3 p.m. British Summer Time and 10 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, the second session that we have is Headlines and Deadlines, Tina Brown's Vanity Fair Diaries. Tina Brown's talks of celebrity, sexism and power, as well as her own stellar work as a writer and journalist in conversation with Chiki Sarkar, the publisher of Juggernaut. In case you were not able to catch our music interlude, we leave you with a short extract from our Jaipur Richa Festival Music Archives. Titi Robin is a prolific French composer and improviser and one of the best exponents of crossover world music today. Titi's tryst with uh, Jaipur began in 1984 when he began playing with the legendary Hamid Khan. Titi and Hamid released an album in 1986 and went on to release over 20 albums, collaborating with musicians from across the world, including Gulabo, the Padma Shri awarded dancer from Rajasthan. Here's revisiting his spectacular performance from the Jaipur music stage. Have a wonderful rest of the week. <laughs> 